Good morning. Let's stand. We're going to worship this morning. And uh, I was told that uh, we know these songs by heart, so we're going to sing with our understanding. That's good. Amen. Praise the Lord. You know, I was in prayer this week, and, and I got a word for three couples. <laughs> oh, boy. For Caleb and Kelsey, for uh, Briar and Savannah, for Joel and Rachel, there's a scripture for you. It's out of uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 41. We shall not all sleep, but shall be changed. Do you get that? <laughs> they all had little ones this past, this, this past summer and uh, just here recently. So praise the Lord. Amen. Okay, Heavenly Father, enough messing around. <laughs> Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning. and We praise you, God. And Father, we know that some of our folks are going to be going to Florida. That's too bad. And God, we pray for Harold and Gloria today. In the name of Jesus, that you would grant them traveling mercies and watch over them, protect them all through this winter, God. May your blessing be upon them. And as they come together in their church down there, God, let it be a time of refreshing and a time in, in which they can just grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ. We pray this morning, Lord, that as we worship, you're welcome here, Lord, to be every part of it here. In the name of Jesus Christ, we thank you and we praise you. Amen. Amen. All right, so if we don't have any words, uh, we know this by heart. We know these songs by heart because we know Jesus and we know that he is full of glory and honor and uh, so we're just going to give him some glory today. Anybody with me? Yeah. Yes. yes. All right. Let the glory of the Lord rise among us. Let the glory of the Lord rise among us. Let the praises of our King rise among us. Let it rise. Let it rise. Let it rise. Let the kingdom of our God reign. Let the kingdom of our God reign among us. Let the kingdom of our God, oh, let it rain, rain among us. Let the joy of our God rise among us. Let it rise, let it rise, let it rise, oh, let it rise. You deserve the praise. 
You deserve the glory. And that's why we're here today, Lord. We're here for you. Praise you, Jesus. Praise you, Lord. We welcome you with praise. We welcome you with praise, Lord.
without light till from heaven you came running. There was mercy in your eyes to fulfill the law and prophets. To a virgin came the word from a throne of endless glory to a cradle in the
As I was worshiping this morning, oh, in my face, just the presence of God is just so amazing in this place. I mean, there used to be a door for his presence, but now there's a gateway. And there's no holding him back. He's coming. He's coming. In this season, you might feel resistance, but God's saying, come. Come, come, come. He's here. I just kept hearing the word increase. 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 You think it's not a time to sow? It's a time to reap. This is the second harvest. I saw somebody last night who said there was a second harvest of raspberries. It's a second harvest time. Go out and expect the increase. He says, my increase has no limits. Your eyes are being opened to see the season that I'm in. You see, and there is no fear. You see every season through my eyes of love and hope. You are my ambassadors to advance the, advance the culture of heaven. Increase, increase, increase. And the Lord said that just like in the time of Elisha, that he's going to be opening our eyes to see that greater is he that is with us than he that is against us. And I just declare an open eyes to see the armies of heaven, the fiery chariots that are partnering with us, that are advancing, that when the government is saying shut down, he's saying open up. When the government is saying stop, he's saying go. You must listen to the voice of God right now. And he's saying in Isaiah 40, he said, listen, it's the voice of someone shouting. Clear the way through the wilderness for the Lord. Make a straight highway through the wasteland for our God. Fill in the valleys and level the mountains and hills. Straighten the curves and smooth out the rough places. Then the glory of the Lord will be revealed and all people will see it together. For the Lord has spoken. The Lord has spoken. His glory is coming in. Expect to see it everywhere. Expect to see it. I release great expectation over this, everyone here, over the body of Christ. The expectations are high. We expect to see you, God, show up in every place, every single place we walk, in our dreams, in our visions, in our relationships, in our work, in our schools, in our cities, in our government. We expect to see you, God. The glory of God is on this nation. Let it be. Let it be, God. Come, Jesus, come. Come, Jesus, come. Increase. Increase. Increase.
are the Messiah, Jesus. You are the promised one. You're coming back soon. We bless your name, Jesus. We believe you. We believe your words, Lord. We believe you. We trust you, Jesus. All your promises are yes and amen, and you are the amen. You are the last word on every subject. You are the last word, Jesus. You are the word. Blessed be your name. As Diane was talking, I just, I just felt like as, as she was giving that word of, of how the church needs to go out, as, as this was a season of, of the second harvest and we needed to go out and begin to reap the harvest, I just felt like there was a resistance from some of us in this room, which is only natural, where we're immediately filled with fear. When God calls us to do something, the first thing we do is say, who, who am I? Who am I to serve this God? And we're immediately filled with this fear of who am I to, to speak to someone about Christ? Who, God doesn't even speak to me. How can I tell someone about Christ? And as, as that, that word was kind of coming through, I just, I felt like God was just telling me to, to read part of Psalms 102. And it says, hear my prayer, O Lord, let my cry come to you. Do not hide your face from me in the day of my distress. Incline your ear to me, answer me speedily in the day when I call. For my days shall pass away like smoke, and my bones burn like a furnace. My heart is struck down like grass and has withered. I forgot to eat my bread. Because of my loud groaning, my bones cling to my flesh. I am like a desert owl of the wilderness. I like an owl of the waste places. I lie awake. I am like a lonely sparrow on the housetop. All my enemies taunt me. Those who deride me use my name for a curse. So as he's just going through this psalm, he's talking about how he hasn't heard from God, how he just feels so distant from God, how he feels in such a lonely place and everything in the world is coming crashing down around him. But if you read through the entire psalm, especially towards the end, it gets so good because it says, of old, 
God laid the foundations of the earth, and the heavens are the work of his hands. They will perish, but you, God, will remain. They will all wear out like a garment. You will change them like a robe, and they will pass away. But you are the same, and your years have no end. The children of your servant shall dwell secure. Their offspring shall be established before you. Because God is with us, what shall we fear? This God that literally saw the beginning of creation, and he will see the end of it. Why should we fear anything in this world? God has seen the end of this world today. He knows the plans of the enemy. He knows the plans of the, the righteous. He knows the plans of every man that walks this earth. So what do we have to fear? If God knows every plan that the enemy has, and he has a better plan than that, why should we be afraid to go out and share his word? Why should we be afraid to stand before the people and proclaim his name? God is in control. We just have to trust in him and step out. He will not return void. So, Lord, we just pray, God, for courage today, God, that we would be constantly reminded that you are the Alpha and the Omega. You are the beginning and the end, God. In your name, we can dwell securely because you are good, because you are a righteous God, and you shall let us dwell in your house forever, Lord. So in this temporary time, God, like like David said, like his, his life is going to pass away like a smoke. Father, this life is temporary, God, but may we give each and every day over to you, God, as if it's our last, God. May we give every moment of our lives over to you, God and live just a full life knowing that there is a greater life to come after this, God, that this world will pass away. God, you said you change it like a garment, Lord. That's how easily you swipe it away, Lord. But you will let us dwell with you forever and establish our names with you, God. So may we find security in that. May we find comfort in that. May fear be cast aside because you have chosen us to be your people, Lord. And we just pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. So why don't you shake someone's hand this morning, give someone a hug, maybe give them a kiss on the cheek, just a little love.
Josh will introduce. Yeah. 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 Brooke, good. We Well, it's so good to have everyone here this morning. Hopefully you got, I got a kiss on the cheek by a man. I don't know how I feel about that. I don't know if we're that kind of church, but anyway. So uh, there's a young lady that, I think she spoke a couple months ago, a month ago, but uh, Brooke has just been uh, so amazing to watch her transformation in, in just a month. To see her, she's just been devouring scripture. She got baptized. Like, God is really doing an amazing work in her. And so last Thursday, she told me that she felt like God wanted her to share something. And so I was like, well, let's do it this Sunday. Yeah. Done. Yeah. So, Brooke, if you want to come up here. <laughs> so about a month ago... I actually got baptized. Before that, a month prior, I gave my life to Christ. Thank you, Sandra. Um, this isn't something I typically do. <laughs> I'm a very laid back, sheltered person. And that's how I'm comfortable, but I've come to learn that God doesn't want you to always be comfortable. So, I'm going to share a little bit about my testimony and how I got to where I am and why I feel the need that God wanted me to share all this with you. Um, so, I just pray that this testimony will reach the hearts of those who are either in a similar season as me or a step behind me. And it's really funny because I asked God, I was like, why me? I mean, I've only been doing this for two months. <laughs> I was like, what can I tell you guys that someone who has been doing this longer than me can't tell you? And I said, I was like, just why? Of course he goes, why not you? And I was like, funny, but no, seriously, why? <laughs> And he, he said exactly that, because there are people exactly where you are, or even a step behind you, that need someone of your background, of your circumstance, to just pull them out of where they're at. So this is me just allowing God to work through me and give me the courage I need to do this. Now, before... <laughs> I even got baptized. I uh, was like, I feel the need to get baptized. And I know that was God speaking to me. So I was like, all right, what do I do? When's the right time? Who does it? All these questions arose. And um, it was actually that week later, I met up with Denise, and we were in Jesus 101 Bible study. And all those questions were answered, and I was like, got it. You want me to get baptized. <laughs> so... A little that following day, I think it was after church, I asked Sandra to baptize me, and it's been a great blessing. She's been a blessing in my life. God stripped everyone out of my life. Friends, family. A guy that I was close to. But he gave me Heidi. He gave me Megan. Gave me Sandra, Denise, this whole family. Like, I don't know any of you guys, but you guys are like my family. <laughs> I knew I was going to cry, so. <laughs> After I got baptized, it wasn't even two weeks later. God's like, you need to speak this message. And uh, I told him that it was funny, that that's not happening. <laughs> and uh, I said, there's, there's no way. I, I don't have the courage to do that. So I kind of shut that idea down. And this happened a month ago. And when I really shut that down, he was silent with me for about a week and a half, two weeks. And I was like, why? <laughs> well, I got, fell down to like a little spiraling of sadness and just feeling lost for about a week and 
then it became apparent to me that I really have to speak this message. So I started telling people, so I went back out of it. <laughs> See, I didn't believe I had the tools to give you a message, and I don't know what you're going to take from it, but I hope you, I, you guys take something out of this. I told God, I was like, I'm just a baby Christian. Like, can't you teach me how to crawl before you just throw me out and tell me to run? <laughs> he was like, no. <laughs> he said to me, do you want to set the pace or do you want me to? Because you can set the pace in your timing and in your strategies, however you will, but you know the outcome. You know what's going to happen. Without God, life just isn't the same. He says, I'll be knocking at your door, just waiting, waiting for you to let me in and help you through every season that you go through. He said that it is my job to provide and help you. Yours is just to trust and have faith in me. Jeremiah 29 11, this is the New Living Translation. For I know the plans I have for you, they are plans for good and not disaster, to give you hope and a future. When I first began preparing this, whatever you'd call this, I asked God to give me a word to base it around. And uh, as Josh already mentioned, fear, that was the first word that he put in my mind. Because if you can't tell, I'm kind of consumed by it. I said, that was good, but I don't think that's the word that we need to talk about because all of us are so familiar with fear. Then he put the word fearless on my heart. And I was like, that's great too, but we need to find a middle ground because, you know, God's fearless, but us in our flesh, we are not fearless. And that's when fear less happened. You're not fearless, you're not fearful, but just try to fear less than what you would typically feel. We all know that Satan is very real, and we know that God is very real, and God doesn't want us to fear because he doesn't not put the emotion of fear on our hearts. Satan puts that feeling of fear on our hearts. And if I just let fear consume me, I would not be up here today. So I just encourage every single one of you to just pray to God every single day through every fear that you may be going through, and just ask him to take even a little bit away from it. Now I thought giving my life to Christ was going to be easy breezy butterflies, and it's not. <laughs> it's not. It's actually harder than I anticipated. I thought my life was just going to go so smooth, but then I learned that trials and tribulations are actually very, very real, and we go through it. And sometimes you're going to fall, but if you just have faith in God, he'll only fall, let you fall a little bit before he picks you right back up. He doesn't let you stray too far. So any one of you who are going through a season of fear, just try to step out and be faithful to God. He will not disappoint you. Yeah. So bow your heads right now. You're going to pray for people. You're going to pray a release over people. If that's you today that you know that God's using this message to speak to you, just simply raise your hand. God will speak to you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you're going to pray, Brooke. Lord, I pray right now that you do not allow fear to consume us. I pray that no matter what season that we're going through, you just send us a gentle reminder that you are always with us no matter what. Mm, yeah. That there is going to be hardships in life. But he's not going to allow you to fall. I pray that he just picks you up and cradles you as the little baby that you are to him. He sees us mm. as so fragile, and just mm. don't forget yeah. that. Mm. We're allowed to feel. Just look to God in every single situation. I pray, Lord, that you just bless every single one of us in this room and that someone has felt something from this message that they can take away from and step out in, in faith and not fear. Yeah, yeah. Lord, we praise you. We are so grateful for you. We love you. And in the name of Jesus, amen. Amen. <laughs> amen. Thank you.
Well, thank you, Brooke. That, uh, that is so inspirational. I love the two phrases. Are you going to let me set your pace or are you going to set your pace? And that is so true. And then being fear less <laughs> because I think we can all relate to that. So thank you for being so bold. That is just awesome. Um, you know what? When we don't think we have courage, when we don't think we have boldness, it's there. <laughs> you just have to just, okay, Lord, I'm just stepping out, believing that you're meeting me. And that was just beautiful. Thank you for sharing. Um, so a couple things from the uh, bulletin. Uh, we have Sue Abelson, who passed away uh, on October 7th. And her celebration of life service will be here at Cornerstone tomorrow at 11 o'clock. So we don't want those of you who um, really love Sue to miss out on that. Um, so, and then there's uh, the committal service at the Hurley uh, Cemetery. And then there's going to be a luncheon at Sharon's. Um, we are going to do a prayer around the clock. November 6th and 7th. If you've never been part of that, it's 24 hours of just continuous prayer here. And you can sign up for an hour time slot. Uh, we don't sign up today. I don't have the sign-up sheet today. But um, here in the next week or two, we'll put that out. We're going to be praying for our nation, for children. There's an assault um, in this country on our children. The unborn and those who are in school. Uh, I was at a woman's gathering the other night. And... Um, just one of the mothers was just so distressed about what was happening on the playground uh, with her son. And um, the enemy is being really vicious right now, but we've heard some really great words. And um, I want to just share a little bit about the second harvest. I think Brooke is probably part of the second harvest. There's probably people that before, you know, a couple months ago spoke about Christ to you, but for some reason passed over. Second harvest, those people that you've maybe disconsidered, okay, you know, I've already talked to them about Jesus, and they just kind of resisted. Go again. Second harvest. Um, we have Joan and Bruce Dahlman, who not only uh, are, are wonderful, uh, a wonderful man and woman of God, but they have actually literally had a second harvest. And so they have tomatoes and eggplant and I, I, I can't remember. There, there was several, like five or six different types of vegetables that they gleaned from their garden again. And their car is parked right out here. So at the end of the service, if you want some fresh vegetables, uh, second harvest <laughs> provided from Bruce and Joan Dahlman. So praise the Lord. Um, that's going to be, a, I think, a word that he's uh, sharing and speaking to us right now is... We are not going to grow weary, for in due season we will reap the rewards that he is calling for us to reap. And um, we have life rings. Uh, I'm sorry, I put Alan. Uh, Alan, I put you in this week. It confused me because October has five Fridays and five Saturdays. <laughs> so Alan actually did have his uh, life group last night. Tammy is the one that if you'd like to join a life group this week in Besmer, uh, Tammy Carnan, uh, it will be at her home at, um, well, the, the address is 104 North Cedar Avenue, 630. Uh, we were able to go there last night and just pray the peace and presence of God around that place. So uh, you want to connect with somebody uh, Friday night. Or, again, we have our Wednesday night. We have Monday night. Um, I read this verse about connection from Hebrews chapter 10, and it says in verse 23, so now wrap your heart tightly around the hope that lives within us, knowing that God always keeps his promises. Discover creative ways to encourage others and to motivate them towards acts of compassion, doing beautiful works as expression of love. This is not the time to pull away and neglect meeting together, as some have formed the habit of doing. You know, COVID really did try to pull us apart. But God is saying, this is not the time to pull away. We, and like Diane mentioned earlier, this is the time to go. This is the time to rise up. This is the time to connect. In fact, we should come together even more frequently, eager to encourage and urge each other onward as we anticipate that day dawning. So praise the Lord. Um, I want to just encourage you that this week there's somebody that you're going to have to connect with. And God will lay that person on your heart. And like Brooke said, be fearless. 
You need to be obedient to step out and make that connection with those people. Um, all right, we're taking the offering? Okay. If you're a Life Ring leader or facilitator after church today, there is an empowering, an empowering <laughs> uh, meeting, okay? Uh, and that'll be, I think, downstairs with Scott and Diane uh, is leading that. So uh, those who are part of that, please meet with us after church. Otherwise, ushers, come on up. Praise the Lord. We have the time to worship him through our gifts, our giving. God, thank you for all the worship that's already taken place in this building today. Not only from the worship from our lips, but even Brooke coming up here, that was a form of worship. That was a sacrifice, God, that she gave to you, Lord God. She gave you her fear, and it became fearless, and it became faith-filled, Lord God. That was a sacrifice of worship. Thank you, Jesus. God, you are also calling many of the rest of us to do things this week that will feel like a sacrifice. But sometimes, I remember one time, a long time ago, someone said, obedience is the sacrifice. And so, Lord, I just thank you today that you have created in us a heart to be obedient to our Father, to our King, to our Lord. And so, God, we do not want to grieve your heart. We will be obedient. We will say that with our words. I will obey you, Jesus, in what you are calling me to do. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father, that we have an opportunity to just give to you, God, through our finances right now. I will be obedient to give, God. I will be obedient. This church will be obedient, God, to use these resources to further the kingdom of God, your truth, your righteousness, your peace, your joy into our communities and around this nation and world. We give. We have missionaries and I think of Jesus' foot soldiers over in Myanmar, God, that we give, God. We have pastors that we help support in India. God, we thank you for a missionary couple who translates the word in Mali, West Africa today. We just thank you, God, for the people who are on the front lines that we have the opportunity to help them be where they're at. So we thank you today, Jesus, for the gifts that you've given. In your name I pray now. Amen. Amen. Well, we welcome you this morning. We're so glad you're here. We're pretty dependent on computers, aren't we? So uh, we don't have any, uh, our, one of our programs went down, and so we'll work on that this week. But, uh, um, you know, Robin mentioned about uh, Sue Abelson, and Sue Abelson used to sit right in front of Alvin and Shirley there. Um, Gloria's going to do something tomorrow at her celebration of life, and uh, we're going to celebrate Sue's life and that chair because uh, people get uh, where they sit in a certain place. And, you know, I, I told you last week that uh, Sue had told me that uh, she had come to faith in Christ because someone had invited her. Someone that was taking care of her dog said to her, why don't you come with me to Cornerstone? And in the late August, 18 years ago, on a Sunday morning, she came and experienced the love of Christ and the hope of Christ, and she found Christ. Yeah. And today, we know that she is celebrating with Christ in heaven. Yeah. I thought, what a great thing. Marissa... Praise God for Marissa. What a girl. Um, where's Marissa at? There she is. Marissa, are you headed back to Oregon this week? Yeah. Yeah, we love Marissa. We love her kids. What a blessing they've been. So thankful that they show up. And she had a word. She said, you know what? She said, the wonderful way that we could honor Sue is to... Um, Somebody, God has uh, somebody on your heart that uh, maybe you've uh, reached out to and what Robin said is second harvest. You've reached out to them and they haven't, you know, you've invited them maybe to come to Cornerstone. Um, but today God's speaking to you and he says, I want you to re-invite them. I want you to invite them to come. And really that's the uh, act of obedience. And so Marissa says, and I believe this is from God, is that you have your phones, text somebody right now, 
How many have phones? I just heard one ring here not too long ago. <laughs> text somebody, text them, and invite them to be a part of what God's doing in your life. So I want to encourage you that you take that as an act of obedience, that you connect with them and you invite them to come and experience the presence of God. I talked with a friend of mine this last week, and him and his wife have, have so sown into, they've literally, they, they were very successful in real estate, but God called them to minister to the church and to pastors, and now for almost the last 25 years, they've done that. They've laid down their lives to minister to pastors, and you know what he told me last week? He said, people are leaving the churches in droves. That's what's happening. They're leaving the churches in droves. And he says, maybe that's not such a bad thing. Because maybe God right now is refining his church. He's saying, I'm calling you to get closer and tighter. And those that really hunger and thirst after righteousness, those that will say, you know what? This is not. See, what Robin said is we need to connect together. Why we're doing life rings and all those things is not because we need to fill more of your schedule full, but these are things that when these days that we're living in right now are difficult, they're difficult. I can tell you that my, my phone, my email, my messenger continually lights up with people that are going through difficult things. Threatening of losing their jobs. I'll meet with a young man. I don't know what to do, Pastor. I can't do this. See, we're living in times where the church has to become so absolutely close and tight because the promise is, as Jesus said, I'm going to build my church. How many want to be a part of that? Oh, amen. We need to be a part of that. His church, his church that's not weak. His church that's not hiding in fear. His church is saying, we stand for what the promises of God's word declares for us. We are standing on some promises. This morning you've already heard a lot of scripture. Because I believe this, that this is going to be something that is not optional for you and I. This scripture right here, because this doesn't change, does it? This doesn't change. Whatever else happens, this remains steadfast and true. That was the word I was hearing. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O oh God. And these words right here will give you the ability to stand and to stand and to stand. Many of you know that we've been talking about the book of in Ephesians, the armor of God. And we've titled that series, The Strength to Stand. Because over and over in about eight verses, Paul uses that word, stand, stand, stand. And so today I challenge you to take your stand. Be like Brooke, be courageous and take your stand. Do what God's calling you and I to do. To stand in these places and declare the promises of his word. They declare in the places where you feel such lies and deception, we need to stand in the truth of God's word. What Robin said, if you don't see it, then, then I can tell you what, you are not looking with eyes that are spiritual eyes. But what Robin said is so accurate and true, is the enemy is targeted our children. He has targeted our children, and we need to be that strong, stable, secure place that says, we will defend our children. Yes. We are going to stand in opposition to these lies, to stand for what is promised in his word. You know, this whole thing, you know, I, I hope that uh, maybe today you might be offended with something I say, but let me just encourage you to take it to the Lord. But these, all these lies that we're seeing right now with transgender, it's just absolutely beyond belief. The more I hang out with kids and the confusion that I see in these children, hear me, we need to stand up and declare that God's created them male and female. You know, you say, well, that's their own choice, Pastor. We let people make their own choices and their own decisions. 
Here, let me just say this, that we can allow that, but why is the suicide rate for people that are struggling with their own sexual identity so much higher than the norm. Why is that? Why is it that we are living right now in a society that is so skewed all these things? And many of them deal with the sexuality. I'm telling you what, it's re- we're, we're reaping what has been sown. And so people are going to have to stand up against that and say, no, this is the word of God. He has created us male and female. He has created us to love the opposite sex. Homosexuality, this is still wrong in the word. It's still a lie in the word. And we need to stand against it and say, not that we become arrogant and angry, because that is religious. But we need to love people in the places where they're living in a place of confusion. See, hopelessness. I challenge us today to take our stand. We're going to read in Ephesians chapter 6. We're going to start reading in verse 10. Oh, yeah, we're going to release the kids. Excuse, thank you for letting me know that, Robin. <clears throat> we need to release kids. They're headed across the street. Wow, there's quite a few taking off. You guys were doing such a great job. You didn't even distract me at all. You're listening. Thank you. Some of you that have been here a while know that I'm easily distracted. I want to take in this morning, I believe that I'm going to read more scripture today than I've ever read in a message before because we have to go back to this. We have to go back to this. Because in a world where we see things changing, we have to go, as I said, back to the things that do not change. And so... We will not have it. Bring your Bibles to church. Everybody have a phone? Get on silent? Good. Oh, how did we get that, Rob? Megan got that for me. Wow, give it up for the Megs. I can take that off my list of stuff to think about this week. We're going to go into Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10 through 14. But even because Megan got that up, still bring your Bibles to church. Finally, be strong in the Lord and the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against authorities, against cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in heavenly places." Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand firm. Stand, therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth. We talked about that last week. Having put on the breastplate of righteousness. We're going to stop right there in Ephesians. So Paul is saying that these are things that are available for you and I. These are things that God has made available And six out of the seven here deal with protection. There's one that's offensive, that's the sword of the Spirit. The rest of them are like a protective shield that God wants to place on our lives. And why is there a protective shield needed? Because there's the cosmic forces of evil that are arrayed against you and I. That's why we need to put on the armor of God. Because we are living in an environment, and it's always been this way. We're going to read in a moment from from Isaiah chapter 59. I I encourage you last week to read Isaiah chapter 53. I would encourage you to begin to read in Isaiah, especially in chapters like 52, 53, 54, all the way up through 60, and you will see the evidence that things don't change as far as There's a force of darkness and there's a force of light. There's good and there is evil. And that has not changed. Because why? Because the heart of man is wicked. Do I need to... Do I need to give you greater examples than the heart of the wickedness that we are facing? And it's always been this way. 
There's always going to be, Isaiah was so clear about this. He was talking about the one that is coming is the righteous one, and we're going to talk about that. And so what this is, is it's made available. The armor is made available for us. But whether or not you and I put on the armor is up to you and I. Because it's available doesn't mean we always put it on. Last fall, I was in my shed out in the back, and uh, I was putting up a, a large door, and I had to take my sawzall, and I was on a ladder, and I was reaching way up to sawzall. Josh is already laughing. <laughs> and there was a track that this overhead door would slide in, and I had to just cut that small track off. And you know what I thought to myself when I was cutting that steel with that sawzall? I thought to myself, you know what? You should probably get those safety glasses. They're right there on the bench. And you know what I did? I didn't do it. And so I'm looking up and I'm cutting and I'm kind of going like this because I realize there are stuff that's falling. And I think to myself again, you know what? You should probably get the safety glasses because that stuff is, could hit you in the eye. And I didn't go and get the safety glasses that were right there. And certainly by that evening, I realized that there was something in my eye besides my eyeball. <laughs> and then I had this bright idea. I said to Robin, I said, please take a picture of my eye with my phone. Because I was looking into the mirror and I couldn't see anything in my eye, but I knew that my eye was watering. I knew that there was something, there was something in my eye and I kept doing what people tell you to flip the lid over and it's going to you know, come out, and it didn't. And so Robin took a picture of my eyeball, and then I did, is, is I blew it up real large. And then right on this side of the cornea, I could see this little brown, or this little silver piece of um, steel. And it was certainly, it was sticking right into my eye. And so I said to Robin, I said, I have a tweezers. <laughs> She said, I don't think so. I said, well, then just take a little needle there and just, <laughs> and I was holding it open and she said, I'm not doing that. The next morning I found myself at the eye doctor and they said, oh yeah, we've met people like you before. <laughs> I said, you can do something with that? She said, yeah, we can do something with that. She said, you're just as fortunate that you didn't leave it go longer because if you would have left it go longer, it would have created rust in your eye and then we would have had to send you to an eye where you could have a surgically remove that rust from your eyeball. All because I did not choose to put on something that was made available for you and I. I use that illustration because of this, because it reminds me that the protective gear that God has given us is available to us. But what we will do at times is foolishly think that I can go through life, I can go through the day without taking the armor that's been supplied, the belt of truth we talked about last week, taking up, what are we talking about now? The breastplate of righteousness. We're going to talk about what righteousness is because righteousness is defined as this, the ability to be morally pure. That's what righteousness is defined as. But I want you to know, and I don't think I need to prove this point to you, that that is impossible for you and I. That is impossible for man to, be, to remain morally pure. That's righteousness. But who is righteous? There's no not one righteous. Isn't that what the word tells us? It goes on to tell us that our righteousness in Isaiah chapter 64, it says, you're not, our righteousness is as what? Filthy rags. Our righteousness is something that we try to place on us, but God knew that our righteousness was not something that we would ever be able to fully attain. We cannot do it. What our righteousness has become is it's become religiosity. It's become, I'm I'm right because I'm better than you. I do this better than you. That's righteousness, our own righteousness. And that's as what prophet Isaiah says is as filthy rags. It's not worth even redeeming. 
See, what we try to do is we try to protect ourselves with our own righteousness, but we need the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. That's the righteousness we need. Isaiah chapter 59, I want to read this scripture to you because it, when I was studying for this message, I was so absolutely, in regards to some of the things I've encountered this last week, the Lord just began to show me more and more. Listen to these words. Behold, the hand, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save nor is ear dull that it cannot hear. But our iniquities, your iniquities, have made a separation between you and your God. Your sins have hidden his face from you, so that he does not hear. For your hands have been defiled with blood, and your fingers with iniquity, and your lips have spoken lies. Your tongue mutters wickedness. No one, no one enters suits justly. No one goes to the law honestly. They rely on empty pleas. They speak lies. They conceive mischief. It gives birth to iniquity. They hatch adders or snake eggs. They weave spider webs. He who eats their eggs dies, and from that is crushed. From one that is crushed, a viper is hatched. Their webs will not serve as clothing. Men will not cover themselves with what they make. Their works are works of iniquity, and deeds of violence are in their hands. Their feet run to evil. They are swift.